Good morning. Welcome to fellowship. Let's stand together. From 1 Chronicles 29, it says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Let's lift our voices and declare his majesty and his greatness.
reminds us in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's read this prayer together. I'll start us off. Eternal God, your love extends into every area of our lives. Your goodness surpasses all expectations. 
You deserve our most joyous, sincere, and reverent daily worship. But, but instead, instead, we, we are, are lackluster disciples of Jesus. Our attention to you and your word has lost its focus. Our devotion to you and your kingdom has lost its intensity. And our commitment to you and your mission has lost its sincerity. We are half-hearted creatures, too often going through the motions. Forgive us and set us free from the sin that entangles us. Create within us new hearts filled with your joy and purpose. Enable our lives to overflow with your grace and mercy. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Yes, Lord. We lift our eyes and we look to you, Jesus, our hope, our mercy, our King. We look to you, Jesus.
God, we lift our eyes and we look to you. We look to you, the only God, the God who reigns sovereign over all eternity. You who reign sovereign over our world, over our country, over these upcoming elections. You who reign sovereign over our families and over the smallest details of our lives. We look to you, Jesus, our hope, our confidence. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, God. Thank you for your faithfulness to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for your faithfulness to make a way through your son, Jesus, for us to approach your throne of grace with confidence and boldness this morning, welcomed. Thank you, God. We lift our eyes to you. We lift our worship to you, God. Receive the praise that you alone are worthy of. We bless your name and we pray all of this in the matchless name of our Savior, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Before you're seated, if you could just move to the center of each section, that would be so appreciated. Thank you. Good morning. It's great to see everybody. My name is Jeff Runyon and I'm the men's discipleship pastor here at the Brentwood campus. How about that extra hour of sleep? All right. I hope you're refreshed and excited to be here today. If you're a guest visiting with us for the first time, we're glad you're here. Out of all the churches in Nashville that you could go to, you chose to be with us, and we're very grateful. Um, as you came in today, I hope everyone picked up our, our program. You'll notice our program is a little lighter than normal. Basically, what happens is now we have quick highlights of the things that are happening in our church. And I hope that as you, we hope that as you read those and you catch interest in some of those things, you'll go to our website for more details. But that, that particular uh, announcement sheet there will let you do that. At the bottom of our card, there's a, a contact card. If you want to have more questions for us or want to learn more about us, or if you have just a prayer request that you want to share with us, this is for everyone to be able to use. You can fill that out and put it in the offering basket or give it to one of our volunteers out in the, in the outside there or at the connect point. That'll be just fine. I want to very quickly highlight a few things that are on our, our program. The uh, next Sunday is the Adoption and Orphan Care Picnic. That's going to be over in the barn from 1215 to 2. Uh, our pastor of all things wonderful, Marty Schwederman, has led us in adoption and orphan care for the last 15 years. And there have been hundreds that have been affected and lives have been changed over adoption and foster care here in our body. There's a picnic for all those that are going to, that's been a, a part of that over the last uh, year, several years. You can be, uh, go out to there to that. If you're just interested in that, if you want to learn more about what's happening in adoption and orphan care, you're welcome to go to that picnic. Uh, the Young Adults 20s and 30s Crowded House event next Sunday night. That's at mine and Donna's house. So we're about to find out how many young adults can fit in our house. But you're invited to come out if you're in your 20s and 30s and want to meet other young adults in our body. And then the Man to Man event, I get to lead in that. Um, the last Thursday of this month, that's the Thursday after Thanksgiving, our next Man to Man event. I've designed it to be a connection event. We're going to call all of our men to come together, and we're going to get in groups uh, around what, where we work and the areas that we work. Like, I'm going to have a group of guys that are going to gather that work in science and technology, and another group's going to be in arts and entertainment and sports. Maybe you're in healthcare or wellness. You're going to be in that group. And maybe you're in education or working with students. You get to meet other men in the body around that. So we're just going to come together to encourage each other, to pray for one another about our challenges that we face there, and how we can be a kingdom influence a godly influence in those spaces that we work and live and breathe every day. So that's coming up the last Thursday of this month. And if you've been participating in our 40 days of fasting and prayer over the last couple of weeks, that comes to an end a week from Friday. And we're going to conclude with a night of prayer here on our campus. It's going to begin at 8 p.m. and go all the way to 6 a.m. So we want to invite all those that can in our body to find an hour in that window and just come out and participate to pray with us there. So keep those things in mind and let us know if you have any questions about those events. Would you pray with me? And then after this, we'll have our offering. Father, I'm grateful for the opportunity for us to be here today. 
And we're grateful for this season in our church's life where we're celebrating 20 years of your faithfulness to us. And we can also envision what the next 20 years will look like as we get to help people find wholehearted life in Jesus. Father, would you renew our minds today? Would you replace the lies that Satan bombards us with each day that maybe we believe with the truth of your word and your gospel and your grace and your incredible love for us? Father, you know us in our deepest parts of us. You know our emotions, our feelings. And I pray that as we feel those, as we go through those, Lord, that you'll help us not to run away from you, but to run to you, who is our ultimate need and meet all of our needs and satisfy our souls. Father, I pray that as we live our lives, that you will transform our deepest desires, that those will reflect what your desires are for our hearts, not what we have in our own selfish motives. And then, Father, I pray that you would help us to make choices, choices that honor and glorify you as we live a life, a heart that loves you with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. For it's in Jesus' name we pray those things together. Amen. Ushers, if you'll come forward. Why don't you go ahead and open your Bibles to that passage in Acts chapter 1. If you haven't already, uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes catching us up in our wholehearted series, and then we're going to go on today to talk about our strategy. And and we've given this the subtitle of our sermon, This is How We Grow. And I want to talk about that. There's, There's significance to that phrase that we'll get into. But we've been in a series, I think we're now on week six of a seven week series. So we'll wrap it up next week. And we started with the story of fellowship over 20 years, what God has done and the lessons we've learned from that. And then we talked about the core values that we have as a body flowing out of 20 years. God has been intentional to shape us in our young adult years as a church to create certain um, personality traits and character traits of our body. And, And this is what those five core values are. We are word centered, spirit dependent, better together, courageously real, and not about ourselves. And of course, each of those, you can kind of double click on those words and a lot of scripture and definitions we'll unpack. I'd encourage you to look at our website where we have all of this uh, written. Lloyd did a great job of explaining these and he talked about an arrow and how these five core values are like the fletchings on an arrow that keep the arrow pointing straight. The next week we talked about the target for our arrow, which is our mission statement. We'll put that over here on your right. We exist to glorify God, which is the mission of all humankind, by the way, and make disciples, which is the mission of the church. Here's how we're going to do it at Fellowship, by helping people find wholehearted life in Jesus. And what I love about that mission statement is it begs a question. The question, if someone hears it for the first time, is what do you mean by wholehearted life in Jesus? And, and I would say that's exactly the question that we want to answer for you. And, and where we go next is to say, you know, the heart, according to the Bible, is the core of who you are. It's not just your emotions or feelings. It's not just your, the romantic part of you. The heart, according to Scripture, is the center of you. And it's used in all kinds of ways in Scripture. And we've talked about the heart this way. 
The heart is our thoughts, it's our choices, it's our desires, and it's our emotions. Thoughts, choices, desires, and emotions. And we've used this graphic of kind of a disconnected heart or an unintegrated heart or a disintegrated heart to represent that we, through our sin, have essentially been disconnected. Our thoughts have been disconnected from our emotions and desires and choices. And this explains all of the sin that you struggle with. Because there are things that you know you shouldn't do, but you do them anyway. And there are feelings that you have that you don't know what to do, so you just go straight from your emotions to your choices. And you have desires in your heart, and sometimes you go straight from desires to choices without integrating what you know to be true and and processing this whole piece. So we've been talking about what would it look like to have a whole heart or an integrated heart. And we described that for you last week with what we're going to call the four characteristics of a transformed heart or the four characteristics of wholehearted life in Jesus. And this is what it looks like. When your thoughts are transformed, it looks like a renewed mind. When your emotional life is transformed, it results in Healthy relationships. When the desires of your heart are transformed, it looks like a satisfied soul. And when the choices you make are transformed, it looks like an active faith. So a whole heart or a transformed heart, which can only happen through the regeneration of the spirit and faith in Jesus Christ, we begin to grow like this. This is a picture of a mature disciple. And this is not something that any of us will ever fully attain to. We're like Paul. That's like, you know, I can't fully get there, but I'm pressing on toward the goal, that goal of maturity that will only be fully known when Christ returns. So these four things, more than anything else, are going to define the curriculums that we teach through our small groups and other classes. These four things are going to define how we teach God's Word as we teach it expositionally, week by week, helping you to renew your mind. These four things are going to shape how we do children's ministry, how we do student ministry, how we do adult ministry. This is the core of what we're going for, a transformed heart. Or we can say it this way, this is what wholehearted life in Jesus looks like. All right, all that's review. Where we're going to go today is how in the world are we going to help people find wholehearted life? We have worked hard to make our strategy as simple as possible. Because everything we've taught you so far, I I don't want to say it's complex, but it's rich. It's deep. Like, I hope that you've learned some things about the heart. I know I have as we've explored this concept. Uh, I hope that you've realized that our vision is based on deep doctrine, deep theology. It's looking through all 66 books of the Bible and seeing this pattern of our hearts been disconnected. Jesus came to transform our hearts, giving us new hearts so we can love God with all our heart and love other people with all that we are, love our neighbor as ourself. This is the story of scripture. It's deeply theological. We want our strategy to be as simple as possible. In fact, we've talked about it. We want it to be so simple that every person in our congregation could draw it on the back of a napkin. Now, why a napkin? Well, you know, I could have chosen all kinds of things, post-it note, etc. But there's a lot of famous napkin drawings out there. Some of the best ideas for businesses, some of the best architectural designs started on the back of a cocktail napkin. And I want to just give you a couple examples of that. How many of you have ever flown on Southwest Airlines ever in your life? You know, raise your hand. Southwest Airlines, by some measures, is the most profitable airline in the world. The idea for Southwest came from the back of a napkin. The founders were talking one time over dinner. They had this image that came to mind, what would it look like if we just took those three cities in Texas, the Golden Triangle, and we built an airline around serving those three cities? And of course, it grew from there, but that was the genesis of Southwest Airlines. Let's talk about City Group. In 1998, City Corp and Travelers Group merged to form the largest financial services company in the whole country. They needed a new logo that would represent this. They hired a design firm and paid the design firm $1.5 million to design their new logo. And you know where they got it? on the back of a napkin. (laughs) Literally, the, the, the lead designer, the founder of this design firm company, sat with them for the very first meeting, and as she was listening to them describe what they were going for and what their struggles of the merger were, she took five minutes and drew that right there. That's actually the very image that she drew, and she handed it to them, and she said, this is your logo. 
and, and they said, this is a $1.5 million napkin, <laughs> is what they said. <laughs> but it turned out to be their logo. And here they are 20 years later, and it's a great logo. I mean, those of you that are in the design world, you appreciate the power of simplicity. Let me give you one more example. Pablo Picasso. Story goes, I don't know if this is legend or true, that he was sitting in a cafe one day and an admirer came up, recognized him and, and, uh, and gave him a pen and said, would you sketch something for me, Pablo Picasso? And he said, sure. And he took a pen and the, took a cocktail napkin and he drew something like this, you know? <laughs> yeah, that, that's from, that's Pablo Picasso. And, he, and, and before he handed it to the lady, he said, that'll be, you know, X numbers of thousands of dollars, whatever the price was he quoted. We don't know the exact price, but it was something absorbent. And, and she said, how can you charge so much for something that took you 30 seconds? And he said, that did not take me 30 seconds. That took me 40 years. There is power in simplicity. There is a lot that goes into being, being able to communicate something clearly and simply. You heard the napkin sketch of the whole Christian movement from Dr. Shahada's text that he read. And so this is where we're gonna get to Acts 1.8. And, and I'll explain to you why I'm gonna describe it as a napkin sketch. Let's look at that text together, Acts 1.8. This is Jesus talking to the disciples Right before he ascends into heaven, he's going to give them both the mission and the strategy for the church. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now, this strategy right, is so simple. The Spirit's going to come. You're going to be witnesses first where you are right now, i.e. Jerusalem, then to the surrounding area, which was Judea and Samaria. So this is like saying first in Nashville, then all of Middle Tennessee, and, you know, Tennessee as a state, and then to the remotest parts of the earth. It was literally a geographical sketch that Jesus was giving. Now, think about the power of the Christian movement, the most profound history-changing movement ever for 2,000 years, this has been the mission and the strategy of the church. Where are we today? We're in Brentwood, Tennessee. We're like, is that almost the definition of the remotest part of the earth from Jerusalem's perspective? And here we are 2,000 years later. Look at us, hundreds of us in this room, worshiping Christ, being witnesses of Christ. This is the mission and strategy of the church. It could have been drawn on a napkin. In fact, Dr. Shahada said uh, in, in recent years, he actually did an archaeological dig and he found this in the Middle East. It's the napkin sketch of Acts 1-8. Like, who would have thought it, right? <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Like, my intellectual integrity almost <laughs> did not allow me to make this example. And they're like, well, they're going to see right through that, which I wanted you to. I, I did this, okay? I did this this week. All right, there's Israel, you got Jerusalem in the center. There's the dove, okay? Just, I have to tell you what that is because I'm not an artist. But there's a dove. It represents the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples at the day of Pentecost. Now think about how interesting that is. Jesus started his ministry with the Spirit coming on him in the form of a dove. Then you have the Spirit coming on the disciples and the followers in the church through, you know, tongues of flame and wind, etc. cetera. And, and they were to start in Jerusalem, go to Judea, Samaria, Area, which is the surrounding area, and then the remotest part of the earth. So those arrows just emanating outward. So simple, it could have been drawn on a napkin. And who's to say it actually wasn't, but I doubt it. So let's talk now about our strategy. What is our napkin drawing going to be at Fellowship Bible Church? You know, what's it going to look like? How are we going to help people find wholehearted life in Jesus? Well, I, I want to show you. And in fact, my objective today is to actually allow every one of you to literally draw this on a napkin. That's coming later to be able to share it with someone else. I'm going to draw it on the whiteboard. You don't need to sketch it yet because you're going to actually have the opportunity to. I just want you to watch and want you to look. Thank you, Joe. Now, we've got some new technology that we're trying out today. So theoretically, and it actually worked in first service. There's, there's the board. I'm going to draw on this, and it's going to show up on the screen. It's pretty cool. Our strategy starts with a transformed heart. So right here in the middle of this board, I'm just going to draw a little heart with a cross in it. 
This represents someone finding wholehearted life in Jesus. And, and, and this heart, or you know, represented, representing symbolically, is gonna be at the core of everything we do. Our strategy is gonna revolve around helping people find wholehearted life in Jesus. And this concept is gonna impact all that we do. Now, around the heart, I'm simply next gonna draw four shapes. Up at the top and bottom, I'm gonna draw two squares. So I've got a square up here. It's roughly a square, okay? And a square down here. And then on the sides of the heart, I'm gonna draw two circles. Now, if you think about strategy from a church perspective, it simply comes down to what rhythms and venues are we gonna invite you guys into? And when I say you, I mean us as a church. What are the rhythms? What are the weekly rhythms? You're in one right now, our worship service. What are the other rhythms that we want to invite you into? These two squares represent fellowship rhythms. In other words, these are weekly things that we're going to invite you into every week if you're a part of this church. These two circles are personal rhythms that we want to equip you for 24-7 in your homes, in your workplaces, in your communities. And you'll see how this plays out. It'll make a lot more sense when I fill in these shapes. Let's start with the first one. We're going to call this first box up here, your church. By the way, we are intentionally using as simple language and as simple drawings as we possibly can. So this is your church, and I'm going to draw it simply with a stereotypical, recognizable church building with a stick figure inside it. And, and that's you, that's me, that's anyone that calls Fellowship Bible Church their home. Now, what we mean specifically by your church is we're talking about the weekly rhythm of our worship service, where you're seated, where you're seated right now. Studies have shown all over the country and, and, and probably all over the world, but mostly in the United States, weekly worship attendance is dramatically decreasing. Right? People will say, yeah, I go to church. And what they really mean is they go every six weeks or they go every eight weeks. Uh, you all did a survey in, in May or June and, and everyone filled out this paper survey if you were there on, on that day when we did that. And we actually found that, that you all are above average in church attendance. And according to our numbers, you know, there's about 60% of you or a little bit more that self-report you come to our worship service four times a month. Believe it or not, that's much higher than the average, and we're glad about that, but we want more and more of us to be at church as part of a weekly rhythm. Right? New Testament says, don't neglect gathering as believers. There's a lot that goes out on in this hour and 10 minutes, or you know, depending on who's preaching hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> that, uh, that's actually Lloyd and me, so you know, <laughs> b b both of us are... Uh, uh, we, we do that. But there's a lot that goes on in your church on a weekly rhythm. We want to invite you to be a part of that. Now, think of this as a worship service. You worship in one hour and you serve in another. We want as many of you as possible to be a part of that rhythm. Come to one service and worship. Come to another service and serve. And a little less than 50% of you are regularly serving here at the body. And we thank you for that. We want to invite all of you, or as many of you as can, and I know not all of you can, to worship in one hour and serve in another. Because you're actually growing by living out that wholehearted process. Active faith is a big part of your service here. So your church, we want you to worship and serve on a weekly basis on Sundays or Wednesday nights. And I mention that because we have our student ministry here and many of you in the room volunteer in that ministry. Was that a shout out I just heard? Yeah, that was a shout out I just heard. All right, so weekly rhythm, your church, worship and serve Sunday mornings or Wednesdays. There's one more weekly rhythm that the fellowship's gonna create or it has already created that we wanna invite you into and that's called your group. Your group. And, and I, here's what I'm gonna, how I'm gonna draw this. The same stick figure from above which represents you or me or, or any of us. But now I'm gonna draw two more stick figures next to us to represent a small group. And they're connected by just a curved line. So you can see they're shoulder to shoulder, right? They're walking together. Here's how we're gonna define a small group at Fellowship because we've got a, a variety of small groups. We're gonna define a small group as any group less than 20 that meets weekly, or close to weekly, intentionally helping one another find wholehearted life in Jesus. The scripture calls us to community. 
And as much as we'd like to call this community, and by the way, we're working hard at making our worship services be more communal because this is a hard place to connect. We realize that we're working hard on that. You will not find community as rich and as rich and deep here as you will if you join a group. Now, we have around 60% of you, which is interesting that the same percentage that come four times a week are, are about 60% of you are in a group of some kind. And we want to celebrate that and we want hopefully that percentage to keep growing because we believe we need each other and we need to walk with each other. We need to do life together. So any small group of people meeting weekly or close to weekly, helping one another find wholehearted life in Jesus. Let me give you some examples. We've got a marriage group that's going to start in January. Information's in your program called Reengage. Guys, I cannot encourage you enough. Like we're seeing God do remarkable things through reengage. We're seeing couples who have a good marriage come out with a great marriage. We're seeing couples who have a, a really hard marriage. Some that are even saying, this was our last ditch effort that God is doing a work in their lives. It's a small group based. It's actually a large group gathering and a small group breakout group. Uh, 17 weeks starting in January. It's a significant commitment. It will serve you the rest of your life in your marriage. That's an example of you getting in a group. There's all kinds of other groups. We have men's groups, women's groups, couples groups. Just get in a group. Walk with other people. That's all we're going to ask of you, men and women. As far as fellowship goes, we know y'all are, are busy. You've got a lot going on in your life. As many of you are able, come weekly and worship and serve at your church and get in a group and meet weekly or close to weekly. You'll be amazed just doing those two things those two things, those two weekly rhythms, how much you'll start to grow. All right, I've got two more circles I want to cover. And again, these are personal rhythms. The first we're going to call your walk. This is your walk with Christ. This is your spiritual life. This is your daily 24-7 relationship with the God of the universe. And we're going to depict your walk simply by drawing a pathway here. And there you are as a stick figure walking along the path, and, and I'm going to draw a, a walking stick just to sort of represent the hike, the journey. Like we're all in this, this beautiful pilgrimage called relationship with God. And we at Fellowship, those of us that are on the teaching team and the elders and, and leaders and staff, we want to do even more to equip you for your walk. We can't do the walk for you. You wouldn't want us to, but we can equip you. So imagine a future where we do more things like the 40 days of prayer and fasting. For those of you that have been in that, and it's about 2,000 people receiving those texts every day, I guarantee if you've been following along, it's been a boost to your walk with God. We think this is a space that our church can do a better job of serving you in, of equipping you in, so that we're all walking together, focused particularly on Bible engagement and prayer. So here's some of the things that we want to do, and we haven't created all this yet, but it's coming. We want to equip you with a very simple way to engage the Bible every day. That's not complicated, that's not hard, but easy to use, easy to remember. We want to equip you on how to pray, how your prayer life can go from a stale thing that doesn't feel like it's going past the ceiling to actually a life-giving relational conversation with God. We want to equip you for that. Parents and grandparents, we want to equip you how you can disciple your children in their walks with God. Teach them how to engage the Word. I know that feels intimidating. We want to make it easy for you. So there's all kinds of things we're dreaming about in this space. They're not any weekly rhythms we'll call you to. It's a daily rhythm we're going to equip you for in your own home. Does that make sense? So this is your walk. Got your church, your group. Those are the only two fellowship rhythms we're creating, but we're going to equip you in your walk, and we're going to equip you in one more area of your life, and we're calling that your world. Your world. And let me define this for you as I draw it. We're defining your world as where you live, where you work, where you play. And there you are engaging in your world and to the remotest parts of the earth. This is Acts 1.8 being lived out. Our Jerusalem, our Judea Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. 
Some of you are called to live out your faith and express active faith in your homes. Like that's where the biggest challenge is. Some of you, as Jeff was talking about, are, are called to do that in your workplace. Some of you are involved in, you know, parent-teacher organizations and soccer teams right around this area. And, and you're called to be involved in our community in some new and rich ways. Some of you are called to go to the ends of the earth. All of us are called to pray and give. Your world is where you live, where you work, where you play, into the remotest parts of the earth. And we want to do more to encourage you and equip you. How do I share my faith with my kid? How do I live out my faith in my workplace in a way that's not weird. <laughs> How do I engage my community? What would it look like if my home what was a place of a redemptive outpost for our neighborhood where, where families were coming all around and just finding, finding something in our home, in our space. You see, some of you will grab onto those kinds of things. All of us need to engage somehow, some way in our world our worlds. This is our strategy. Now, we're going to connect it to remind us it's a weekly rhythm. So I'm going to draw these little connective lines here. You're going to be weekly engaging worship and serving on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights, walking with God every day, at some point in the week, gathering with a small group of people to help each other in your walk. And you're going to be engaging your world where you live, work, and play. And when God calls you, to the remotest parts of the earth. This is our strategy. It is so simple. I hope that you see this and you're kind of like, this is it? This is it. But I want you to think about the power of focus. For us as a church to say, here are the four things we're gonna be about. And we're gonna grow in all four of these areas together as a body. Now. The picture's not quite complete because as we looked at this, we said, if we're not careful, even this strategy could become about us, could be about fellowship, could become inward. So I want to show you where multiplication comes in. I'm gonna draw one more little stick figure. In your world, there is someone that God is calling you to come alongside and encourage and share Christ's love with. There just is, either in your home, in your workplace, in your community. There's someone God's calling you to. What would it look like over time for you to be someone who's walking with other people as they find wholehearted life in Jesus? What would it look like for God to use you to start praying for just one person that you would help find wholehearted life in Jesus, our mission statement? So I wanna draw a little arrow that just represents this cycle continuing with each of us coming alongside others and saying, you are missing something. You've moved to Tennessee for the good life. What you really need is the whole life. That starts in the heart. Your heart could be transformed by Jesus Christ and you can begin to find wholehearted life. As your mind is renewed, your relationships become more healthy, your soul will get a bit more satisfied in Jesus and you can have an active faith. This is what we are calling us to as a body. Now, here's what I want to do. We actually have some napkins and, and some markers for you. So ushers, if you would go ahead, we'll start passing those out. And, and I know some of you will, you'll sort of shun this part of it. You know, it's like, oh, grumble, grumble. I don't want to draw on a napkin, you know. Um, Truth be told, I'm that guy when I'm in your place, okay? But since I'm up here, I'm actually gonna ask you to engage. I'm gonna call you to engage. And I wanna tell you why it's important for you to engage in this part of our worship service. And yeah, ushers, just go ahead and start passing those out. Grab a napkin, grab a pen. You can use your own pen as well, but these markers we've actually tested out. They work pretty well on these particular uh, Costco cocktail napkins, all right? <laughs> I think that's where they came from. Uh, here's why we're gonna, and when, once you get it, by the way, don't, don't draw it yet. I'm gonna walk back through it and we'll draw it together. Here's why I want you to engage this. I've grown up in church all my life and I've almost always been a spectator, not a participant. And I, I'm not talking about when I went to ministry, then I shifted from being a spectator to participant long before I went into ministry. And you know, some of you know my story. I, I, w I went to seminary late. I had a, a career before I started, beginnings of a career anyway. And I remember there was a, at some point in time when I was probably in my late 20s, early 30s, that I started realizing 
I can no longer be a spectator. I, I can no longer just come to church to consume religious goods and services. I need to be a part of a body of Christ. And that decision there to move from a spectator to a participant changed everything for me in terms of my walk with God, in terms of my relationships with other people. There's some deep transformation that happened just by making that conscious decision. I'm gonna step out from spectator mode with my church to participant mode with my church. And I know we're all consumers. We're kind of born this way. You get to choose what grocery store you shop at. You get to choose where you buy your clothes. You get to choose what entertainment you consume. You've got choices, choices, choices. And you can treat church that way. There's lots of great churches in this area. Lots of churches that we would love for you to explore that God's going to move and help and work. Wonderful churches in this area. But he's led you here. For whatever reason, he's led you here. And we're going to ask if you're willing to be not just a spectator, not just a consumer, but a participant in the body of Christ, which is locally expressed in this place. And so I'm gonna invite you to, to draw, and, and even if you're a guest this morning, why not be a part of this experience with us so you can better know what this church is like? The other reason I wanna encourage all of us to be a part of this is at some point in time, you're gonna have a conversation with someone and they're gonna say, tell me what's going on at your church. Tell me about your church. And who knows, there might be a, a napkin around and there might be a pen. And you can say, I can actually draw for you very simply what our church is all about. It starts with this. I'm gonna encourage those of you that have a napkin and pen ready to go, go ahead and draw along with me. It starts with a transformed heart because all of our hearts need to be changed. The Bible talks about the heart being the center of all that we are. And until Jesus transforms your heart, you won't have the kind of life you were made for. We're all about helping people find wholehearted life in Jesus. And we go about doing that in four ways. And, and each way is, is represented by a shape. There are, are two squares, the top and bottom, and those are weekly rhythms. The first is called your church. And in your church, it's a weekly gathering where we come to worship and serve together. And then at that point in time, you'd probably tell them a little bit about what our weekly gathering is like here at Fellowship, the kind of preaching we do, the kind of teaching we do, what our learning center is like for your kids, etc. We also encourage everybody to be in a group. And, you know, very creatively, we've called this part of our strategy, your group. This is represented by three people walking together. Our groups are any group less than 20 that meet weekly or almost weekly, helping one another find wholehearted life in Jesus. Those are the two rhythms of our church, and we're called to be a part of those on a weekly basis. But really what these two rhythms are about is about equipping us in two personal rhythms. And the personal rhythms are 24-7 365 days a year. The first is called your walk. And this is your relationship with God. And here's how you draw this, by the way. You're gonna start about in the center of this circle. You're gonna draw two curved lines that meet at the top that represent a pathway. And then there you are. Stick figure with a walking stick. Our church is serious about equipping people in their walk with God and their relationship with God. And the second personal rhythm is your world. We recognize we're here not for ourselves. And so wherever we live, wherever we work, and wherever we play, we are helping people find wholehearted life in Jesus. But not just here, to the ends of the earth. Now these are all connected in a weekly rhythm. Two weekly rhythms, two daily rhythms. And it's not about us. We're here to help other people find wholehearted life in Jesus as well. And that starts a process that continues where more and more people find wholehearted life in Jesus, more and more people help other people find wholehearted life in Jesus, and the process continues. This is my church. This is my church. I wanna invite us, as we close our worship service, to take this challenge Keep that napkin drawing, maybe in your Bible or 
Keep it somewhere in your car. Keep it somewhere where you can just refer to it. It's not hard to remember. Once you've done it once or twice, you've got it. And I'm gonna encourage you, if you have an opportunity sometime in the next couple of weeks to just share this napkin drawing with somebody. Maybe it's your kid. Maybe it's your child. Maybe, maybe it's someone in your family or maybe it's a neighbor or a coworker or your mom or dad that's just curious. Hey, what, what's going on in your church these days? Take that opportunity. It's important for this to be our strategy as a body because Acts 1.8 calls all believers to be witnesses of Jesus in our, in our Jerusalem, in our Judea and Samaria, and to the other ends of the earth. And there's a lot of churches right now that are doing a lot of complicated things and offering many wonderful programs. And we're not knocking that at all, but we're gonna differentiate just a little bit and we're gonna say, we're gonna be about four things. We're gonna be about four things, at least as it applies to adults. We're gonna be about our, our weekly worship service called Your Church, a weekly gathering in small groups, finding life together as we walk, our own personal walk with God, and our impact in the world for Christ. And that starts where we live, work, and play. Bow your heads with me as we pray, and then I wanna send you out with one more scripture verse as we go. Our Father, it's good to proclaim with confidence that none of this is the work of our own church, but is actually the work of your spirit that you've called us to. And, and I just wanna acknowledge that if you do not empower us, just as you promised uh, your early church in the book of Acts, then we cannot live out this strategy. We cannot live out this mission of helping people find wholehearted life in Jesus. You've given us a season at our 20 year mark where we can just assess and say, what are we to be about? And we believe through a long process, many months of prayer and conversations has gone into these things that we've seen on the screen this morning and seen on the board. And we pray that we believe that this is what you've led us to. So would you empower us by your spirit in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, go ahead and stand to your feet. I wanna read to you a vision. In Acts chapter two, we get a picture of what that early church was like after the day of Pentecost, all right? And this is a vision for us as we grow and lean into our vision and mission and strategy. May God allow our church to look something like this. Acts 2, verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Amen. Let it be here and around the world to God's glory. Have a great week.